Uh, Eugene is a well-renowned condensed matter theorist and uh, he brings these concepts to quantum gases. So he has uh, addressed the large variety of problems, including attractive and repulsive Fermi gases, Bose Fermi mixer, quantum magnetism, impurities, polarons, with a special attention to experimental observables. So we are very uh, honored that you are here today and we look forward to uh, listen to your talk. Uh, thank you, Anna, for this kind introduction and many thanks to all organizers for arranging this uh, very interesting series of talks. So uh, today I will uh, tell you about uh, ideas that we have been developing recently on quantum assisted NMR inference for metabolomics. If you have not heard uh, even the word metabolomics, don't worry. I was in the same situation until uh, a few months ago before uh, we started working on uh, this project. Uh, so I'll explain it as we uh, go along. And uh, just before uh, going into the material, let me uh, just say right away that the main uh, like real credit for this work should uh, go to Dressels, who was a postdoc at Harvard, but is now uh, uh, sort of has recently started his own group at uh, NYU and the Flatiron Institute. Uh, we also benefited a lot from our collaboration with our colleagues from uh, medical school. And uh, also uh, to the end, I'll uh, sort of briefly show uh, results of some of the work inspired by our recent discussions with experimentalists, uh, in particular with people working uh, with uh, iron-based quantum computers in Maryland. Uh, and with Rydberg-based uh, uh, quantum computers uh, from Coera. Okay, so uh, let me maybe start uh, a bit uh, sort of, uh, away from uh, sort of like on a, a bigger scale. Uh, so we hear a lot these days about quantum computing technologies, but I think the best characterization of this field uh, has been done by Serge Harosh, who said that it's uh, really a field trapped between uh, hype and hope. Uh, it's very amusing to look uh, back into the history of predictions for the field. So one of my favorites is uh, the so-called Rose's Law, uh, who was uh, a CEO of D-Wave, who uh, predicted that by 2013, uh, we should have thousands of perfectly working qubits and the quantum computer would be more efficient than all classical computers taken together. Well, and it's uh, interesting to see that enthusiasm uh, is sort of continuous, say Hartmut Neven from Google, uh, not so long ago suggested uh, that computational power of uh, quantum computers uh, is growing as a double exponential, just because uh, the number of qubits is growing exponentially sort of along the lines of Moore's law and Hilbert space of a quantum systems, uh, of a quantum system grows exponentially with the number of qubits. Uh, and of course, uh, there are things which uh, sort of take uh, a more uh, balanced perspective, uh, such as Gambetta's law, uh, where the argument is made that it's not really just the number of qubits that matters, but really uh, uh, their quality, which means we have to include how many operations can be done. So, and again, if we think uh, of, uh, about what uh, we as physicists who sort of stand behind uh, this uh, technology have to show to uh, society in general, I have to admit uh, that I think uh, so far we enjoy surprisingly uh, a lot of uh, faith, right? Uh, so, okay, what if we just look at some highlights, okay, we can say that there was obviously a, like a, a, historical breakthrough of factorization uh, demonstrated with uh, NMR uh, quantum computing. Then more recently, we have seen applications in quantum chemistry, such as rational quantum eigen solvers, or let's say uh, uh, demonstration of quantum supremacy. But probably none of uh, these uh, uh, achievements, even though we are excited about them as physicists, is something that the general audience can relate to, right? We're sort of still just trying to address problems that are interesting uh, to us. Uh, oh, it's remarkable that this did not uh, slow down enthusiasm uh, among investors. Uh, so if you look at uh, kind of money going into quantum computing technologies, it's really staggering. We talk, 
we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so these are not really kind of startups with just a couple of uh, graduate students. And of course, in the news, there have been recent evaluations of billions of uh, dollars of uh, kind of, uh, of quantum hardware companies. And you can say, well, okay, this is not, nothing is new. In fact, in industry, people talk about Gartner hype cycle and we're probably at the peak of inflated expectations. So like soon we will go through the trough of disillusionment and only then we will uh, approach a more realistic uh, perspective on what quantum technology can really uh, give us. But I think the key question is uh, what, like, okay, if forgetting about like high disillusionment, but what is it, uh, what we should think about technologies that can really have an impact uh, on the society kind of uh, on a broad scale rather than just uh, inside physics. And uh, one of the key problems uh, here was uh, so, uh, sort of well, at least one of the key approaches was suggested by John Preskill who said that in the next uh, few years and maybe uh, even longer, we have to think about practical applications of NISC technologies. So we know that we will have quantum computers with a limited number of qubits and they're going to be noisy. The question is, it's not, you know, this perfect uh, quantum hardware in which we can do a uh, Shor's algorithm, but so can we still find some useful application uh, for devices of this type? And uh, he also uh, came up with an interesting suggestion, which uh, to some extent uh, motivates well, uh, a lot of, uh, like it's a part of the motivation behind our work is uh, that the uh, probably the first practical applications uh, of quantum computers will be for uh, systems which are intrinsically quantum. So it's still not clear whether quantum computers have a truly an advantage in modeling some kind of classical optimization uh, algorithms, but for things which are intrinsically quantum, uh, it's kind of natural that quantum computers uh, would be a perfect uh, tool uh, for analysis. Okay, so the uh, main goal of uh, my talk is to uh, show you that uh, we can use uh, sort of existing uh, uh, quantum hardware to solve a problem which is relevant to our colleagues uh, in uh, biomedical research. And this is uh, inference of uh, NMR data. And uh, I'll uh, show you, I'll try to argue that this is something that uh, this task requires bringing together uh, sort of several tools. So uh, it combines quantum simulation, uh, uh, quantum uh, computations, but also classical data science. And we cannot somehow it's really the combination uh, of uh, these three approaches that uh, allows us uh, to uh, sort of to address uh, this problem. Okay, so this is uh, an outline of my talk. I'll explain what an MR uh, inference metabolomic is, including what is metabolomics. Uh, I'll uh, tell you about uh, okay, our proposal for the quantum assisted NMR inference. And uh, uh, as you'll see, this is, uh, is in the class of the so-called hybrid approaches where we combine both quantum hardware and uh, classical uh, computers. I'll uh, briefly talk about machine uh, learning aspects uh, of inference. And then I'll uh, say a few words about, uh, so what are the practical aspects, like how do we, uh, uh, like what are, that there are interesting physics problems uh, that arise when we try uh, to uh, uh, to adapt this algorithm uh, to specific uh, quantum platforms. Okay, so we start by uh, telling you about uh, the uh, NMR inference for metabolomics. So first of all, is metabolomics well in a simpler. Uh, kind of picture, kind of physicist picture, it's a study uh, of uh, small molecules uh, involved in the uh, sort of living cycle of a cell. And these molecules uh, can be a kind of very broad type. We talk about amino acids, lipids, which is fats, uh, uh, and so on. And these, uh, uh, and this field uh, actually has been uh, growing uh, actively recently. It already had an, even though it's it's new, but it had impact on sort of uh, uh, treating different types of cancer, uh, kidney diseases, cardiovascular diseases. In fact, it's uh, even important for analyzing uh, kind of healthy humans if we want to find out how uh, 
let's say, how much they can exercise, how they absorb uh, kind of nutrition, or even if you want to understand, let's say, how caffeine is metabolized in your body, in, in our bodies, it's broken into uh, kind of three uh, metabolites. And uh, naively, uh, what you would guess as a physicist, well, if something is so important, uh, like if these molecules are so important, uh, then uh, our friends in, bi in biomedical scientists should already know uh, about all of them. Interestingly, the answer is uh, that they do not know a vast majority uh, of uh, the small molecules. And in fact, that is what they call metabolic dark matter. So as physicists, we do not actually own uh, the term of dark matter. They have their own dark matter. In fact, uh, if you look uh, at the numbers, it's really surprising. So by some estimates, there should, uh, there should be of the order of 200,000 metabolites uh, like uh, relevant uh, to humans, and only 2,000 of them uh, have been identified. And if we look at the fraction, which is actually used for profiling, uh, for sort of doing uh, quantitative experiments, it is even smaller. And uh, one of uh, the major problems uh, is, uh, uh, well, it's the development of metabolomics for identifying molecules is really having reliable tools uh, for understanding uh, what are uh, for getting information about like relevant molecules. Uh, so two most commonly used tools are mass spectroscopy and NMR. So mass spectroscopy is uh, sort of easy is more common because it's easier to uh, to analyze. But what it does, it really like at most uh, mass spectroscopy gives us information about which atoms uh, uh, sort of are involved uh, in a molecule. But as we know for uh, uh, organic chemistry, right, you can just rearrange a position of uh, atoms and you will get a molecule uh, which has completely different functions. Uh, also, to do uh, mass spectroscopy. Uh, one really has to take, uh, uh, let's say, uh, samples uh, out of a body, then do uh, various kinds of uh, manipulations, like uh, putting in centrifuges. Uh, and, uh, and many of these metabolites are extremely fragile, so they basically break apart before analysis uh, can be done. So uh, fundamentally, NMR uh, would be a more powerful, like is a more powerful technique. However, the issue is interpretation is a big issue. So when we get an NMR spectrum, how do we actually connect uh, uh, the spectrum, which is a collection of peaks, to the actual uh, chemical uh, molecule? Okay, but maybe for uh, some younger people uh, who uh, have not uh, thought about NMR, like let me uh, just say a few words about how NMR works. So think about a very simple system, like we're talking about hydrogen NMR. So we have a proton in the magnetic field. So it's spin one half particle. And uh, so then uh, like a single spin one half particle uh, would like we would have Zeeman splitting. Uh, and that would be the same for all protons. Well, when uh, we think about uh, hydrogen's uh, atoms, uh, then actually the splitting is not going to be the same uh, for uh, uh, all atoms because they see different environment. Uh, so uh, they also experience interaction with other protons. And uh, therefore, uh, the uh, kind of the model uh, which uh, has been shown to uh, provide a, a kind of a good description of, uh, of uh, let's say, the uh, uh, NMR spectrum uh, has uh, a spin symmetric interaction. And I can hear why talking like as a first step, we're just talking about uh, and Mars spectrum liquids, therefore, we should think about molecules rotating uh, in all possible directions, which sort of averages out an isotropy of dipolar interactions. And we also have uh, uh, Zeeman field, but notice uh, that Zeeman energy is not the same uh, for all uh, uh, the protons. It's actually different. So, like basically, it's like G factors are different, or like in the language of. Uh, chemistry uh, or like in MR, so this would be called chemical shifts are different uh, for uh, different hydrogens. Okay, and so as we said, our goal is, uh, uh, like ultimate goal is to go from the spectrum to the molecule, but being physicists, we simplify it to an intermediate uh, step. And uh, so as uh, we were told by uh, our colleagues from medical school, even that would be uh, kind of a very, uh, important and useful steps. So we know the class of Hamiltonians uh, which should describe this NMR spectrum. 
So the question that we ask is, given the spectrum, well, can we reconstruct the Hamiltonian? So, so then, okay, after that, we could ask a, a higher level question, how from uh, the Hamiltonian uh, to go to the actual molecule, but there, like even the knowledge of the Hamiltonian tells us a lot about, let's say, the uh, underlying symmetry of the molecule. So, and I'll show you some examples of this later on. So I will really just focus on this kind of physicist problem of how to go from the spectrum uh, to the Hamiltonian. But what is somewhat unusual is that when we think about an MR, uh, it's really uh, analysis is done at infinite temperature. So uh, the characteristic uh, kind of room temperature is much, much higher uh, than the typical energy scale uh, of, uh, of all the spin configurations. And therefore, when we compute uh, the spectrum, which basically means we compute this, just this uh, spin uh, time dependent uh, spin correlation function, we have to compute it uh, over an infinite uh, temperature uh, ensemble. So uh, maybe again for uh, uh, just a brief comment. So uh, some of you may have heard uh, a question that has been posed some time ago uh, by mathematical physicists whether one can whether one can hear shape of the drum, like for just a simple uh, drum, whether one can reconstruct like the underlying mechanical system from the spectrum, and there the answer turns out to be no. Well, uh, let me uh, sort of uh, so in the case of interacting quantum system system, the answer is actually yes. And you can very easily see the difference that in a classical system, there is a very simple addition uh, of the spectra, right? If we have a few basic uh, sort of tones, then all the excited states, they will be just linear combination of those frequencies. But in interacting many body systems, uh, obviously like uh, there is no addition of the spectra. The spectrum, uh, like a spectrum can be extremely complicated. Another way of seeing this is to uh, notice uh, that the, Hil the kind of Hilbert space and therefore the allowed number of transition grows exponentially with the number uh, of uh, spins. Uh, on the other hand, the number of interactions only grows polynomially. So from this perspective, actually, uh, the problem is overdefined rather than uh, underdefined. Okay, so uh, in a nutshell, uh, the uh, procedure that we suggest uh, is as follows. Okay, so how does one uh, go around computing the spectrum? at infinite temperature, while well, one makes a guess about the Hamiltonian, right, and then compute the spectrum. And if one wants to do it in a classical computer in its infinite temperature ensemble, uh, then what one would have to do is one would have to diagonalize the Hamiltonian. But as we know, uh, like the entire Hilbert space grows exponentially uh, with the number of molecules. Therefore, we talk about solving an exponentially hard problem. And the issue is that it's not only exponentially hard, but we have to do it many times, right? Because we make a guess about the Hamiltonian, we compute the spectrum, it, we check how, how well it agrees with the experimental spectrum. Obviously, kind of our first guess is not going to be perfect. So we think about how to adjust the Hamiltonian, recompute the spectrum, compare again, again, find the difference, sort of a try to optimize parameters. So we have to go through the cycle uh, uh, many times, and uh, what this means is that we have to solve exponentially hard problems sort of over and over again. And this is where the uh, kind of idea of quantum advantage comes in, that if we want to compute a, a spectrum of a quantum model, well, we better use a quantum system. And as I'll show you, that this actually is a, poly, uh, kind of a problem which is a polynomial uh, once we're using quantum computers. And optimization of parameters uh, for the trial Hamiltonians is something that's done on a classical computer. So from this perspective, we're talking about a hybrid system, right? So like we get the spectrum on a quantum hardware, but optimization of parameters is done on a classical uh, computer. Uh, and uh, there have been other suggestions uh, for hybrid approaches. Okay, I'll not uh, go through all of them, but it's, it's very rapidly growing field uh, within uh, quantum computations. Well, let me just say a few words about why I think that uh, this uh, problem uh, is uh, potentially very interesting. So first of all, it addresses uh, the actual need uh, of uh, kind of outside of the uh, physics community. Uh, we talk about sort of existing commercial market. Secondly, on the technical side, uh, interestingly, it is consistent with the kind of hardware that we have now. So typical molecules uh, that uh, people are interested in would have on the order of like 20 uh, spins. Therefore, like if we want to simulate them on uh, 
on the computers while we just have to think about uh, hardware with about like in 20 okay so maybe we need to double it like 40 uh, qubits which is what is available at these days also NMR spectra uh, have their own decoherence in fact if we look at like, and the relevant scale is not the frequency uh, of NMR spectra itself. That, of course, is uh, very high. So, but kind of the overall, uh, uh, the overall same, like the average Zeeman energy uh, of the protons is really relevant to us. We can really sort of get rid of it. What really matters, what comes into the Hamiltonian is the difference of Zeeman energies, uh, which is of the order of tens of hertz uh, rather than megahertz. Uh, and uh, also interactions between the spins is of the order of tens of hertz. Whereas and decoherence, uh, kind of the width of the peak of the peaks uh, is of the order of one hertz. And uh, this shows that actually uh, we can get away with having sufficiently imperfect uh, uh, quantum computers. They just should be good as good as uh, kind of uh, as needed to compute uh, the spectra. Uh, with this uh, accuracy. So uh, I think that's the combination of those factors, I think, make this specific problem very promising uh, for implementing on a NISC platform. OK, so another uh, question you can ask, well, but is it clear that this is even such a hard problem? Somehow intuition is that when we talk about uh, infinite amateur ensembles, things should not really be classical. They should be very. Uh, uh, they should, should, should not be quantum, like they should be some fairly classical. Well, so formally, you can say that actually this problem is equivalent to uh, the complexity class known as DQC1, where you have one clean qubit uh, uh, with uh, uh, coupled to an infinite temperature uh, ensemble. But instead of, and so, and uh, also uh, Shore and Jordan showed uh, that this is something that cannot be. A Problems in this class cannot be simulated classically, but, but instead of going through the formal derivation, uh, let me just uh, show you an example. So let's take a very sim uh, simple system like four spin and a Mars spectrum. So we can compute its spectrum exactly. And here I added some broadening. Uh, or we can apply our kind of simple classical approximation. The simplest one would be Landau Lifshitz. So you see this yellow dashed line does, no, does not look anywhere close to what the actual spectrum is. Or if we use like somewhat more sophisticated classical, semi-classical approach, truncated Wigner with this blue line, again, it's very far from the actual uh, spectrum. So uh, just the coherent evolution uh, uh, generates enough entanglement uh, that computation of the spectrum is intrinsically a quantum problem. Okay, so now let me uh, talk about uh, the protocol and I'll give a very kind of brief version. So like one way uh, to write the spin uh, correlation function, okay, we just have to write this correlation function in time and then do a Fourier transform. And because it's infinite temperature ensemble, we have to sum over all states in our Hilbert space. And uh, the naive uh, uh, approach would be to say, oh, but okay, I want to do it over all states uh, in my Hilbert space and there is exponential large number of them, therefore I'm not actually getting any advantage. What you can show is uh, that it's actually not the case. So what you have to do, you just have to do random sampling uh, from subspaces of uh, total spin polarization. Of course, for n molecules, total spin polarization, uh, like of spin one half particles go, goes from n over two to minus n over two, so it scales with n. Uh, also, just to uh, measure polarization, uh, uh, we have to do n measurements because polarization can scale uh, up to n. Therefore, the computation itself uh, goes as uh, n squared uh, rather than exponential in n. Uh, so then the uh, simplest approach, uh, like if we just wanted to implement it, we would just say, okay, well, we do the sampling of initial state. We compute this time correlation function on our quantum computer, and then we do a classical Fourier transform uh, on our classical machine. Well, but if uh, we have uh, what we have learned from uh, quantum information is that one of the key advantages of uh, quantum computers is that they're very good uh, in doing uh, quantum Fourier transforms. So therefore, one can actually design a circuit in which we do not have to compute Fourier uh, transform by hand, but uh, rather it's actually uh, we do a quantum phase estimation. So the output 
uh, of our quantum circuit is already the spectrum itself. Uh, again, without going into the details, the idea is that we have to double the number of qubits. So this is our system, then we have a copy, and the system evolves with a Hamiltonian, whereas this uh, ancilla qubits they involve with a conjugate. And you can think about it as if you just go back to the usual time evolution, notice uh, that there is uh, the usually two minus HT evolution operator and the conjugate. So you can say that kind of the usual evolution is how the system evolves uh, and ancilla evolves uh, with this conjugate. And then when we do a phase estimation, uh, what we get as a result is uh, the uh, is the Fourier uh, spectrum directly. Okay, so, okay, sorry for skipping all the steps, uh, but uh, the idea is that, yes, we can solve, uh, we can uh, find an efficient uh, way of uh, simulating uh, spectra, of obtaining spectra on a quantum computer, but now we can ask, okay, how easily can we extract uh, Hamiltonian parameters uh, in order to make it useful? And, uh, this turns out to be uh, not such a simple uh, problem. So if we start with a completely random Hamiltonian without putting any knowledge, and we try to sort of do some standard tricks of like say gradient descent and hope that it will, uh, as it will take us to uh, the correct values of the Hamiltonian parameters, it will not work. We'll be, it's a very rough landscape and we will stuck in uh, one of the local minima. And physically you can understand that our spectrum consists of many uh, kind of peaks, and like uh, this individual minima correspond to your kind of trial spectrum, uh, sort of capturing one of the low, one of the uh, uh, kind of peaks uh, in the in the spectrum. Not all of the peaks, but just one of uh, the peaks. And because it captures just one peak, it's enough to make it a local minimum. It's, and it's very difficult to sort of get out uh, of uh, this local minimum. Well, so therefore, we have to do uh, some work before we can do optimization. So actually, this is uh, where, uh, where Dries' uh, uh, insight uh, also came in. So what he did was to take actual molecules and like as a test case, uh, we took uh, just, you know, I mean, these actual molecules uh, are sort of relevant uh, for humans, but they only have four spins, you know, so then, uh, so we took them from uh, known data sets and uh, then uh, Dries uh, uh, ran a uh, basically a clustering algorithm, algorithm so in this case, uh, TISNE. And uh, what he found is uh, that if we take the actual molecules, uh, right, relevant uh, for uh, human metabolomics, uh, then they sort of break into four clusters, right? And so if we, uh, like you can, uh, you can see that, for example, if we think about the distances, okay, this is sort of after we sort uh, these uh, molecules based uh, on this clustering, we see that the distances between molecules, between spectra within one cluster is much smaller than distances between uh, different clusters. And in fact, once you uh, see this clustering, you can also sort of just look at the structure of the molecule and recognize well, okay, it's probably not so surprising because some of them, let's say, oh, we have a metal group. And if we have a metal group, right, we have uh, this like uh, three hydrogens, uh, which uh, sort of three one half spins, which are really identical. And that's why the spectrum is very symmetric. It has a large degeneracy. Uh, uh, or we have this benzene ring, which sort of looks closest to what we would expect, uh, like a spin chain out of four spins. And this is a spectrum which looks uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, the most chaotic. So uh, this there is actually this clustering is not incidental. It actually shows that there are there is some chemical uh, sort of similarity. But of course, it doesn't mean that uh, all uh, the molecules are exactly the same. I mean, they are still sufficiently different. It's just like off show that there are there is some similarity uh, in them. And uh, then what uh, one can do is uh, that if one uh, sort of when one uses a new, brings in a new molecule, the first thing one can do is find which cluster it is in. And once we identify which cluster it is in, then at least within the cluster, the spectra are sufficiently close that now you can do uh, some kind of optimization and you will not be stuck in a local uh, minimum. In fact, uh, so Dries also developed a very elegant algorithm uh, for doing this, which is uh, based on Bayesian inference. Basically, uh, the idea is uh, that if we think about uh, sort of spectral functions, right? They, I mean, spectral functions are 
uh, sort of a normalized uh, positive definite. So from this point of view, they really look uh, like probability distribution functions, uh, which are used in statistics. And we can think about, let's say, spectra uh, given the values of parameters. So theta are really Hamiltonian parameters, like those Js and you know those chemical shifts. Uh, and uh, so from that, you can bias the theorem. We can uh, sort of try to extract knowing uh, like the spectra that has been measured, what can we learn about the probability distribution of parameters of the Hamiltonian? And uh, one uh, can then build a recurrent uh, procedure uh, where, okay, every time you measure a spectrum again, uh, you improve your knowledge uh, about, uh, you sort of make uh, a better guess about the distribution of uh, parameters uh, of uh, the Hamiltonian. And, 10 uh, minutes. Okay, Ten yeah, minutes. Yeah, I should be, yes, thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, one can show that within uh, this procedure, okay, so uh, this, uh, it technically turns out uh, that it's also easy to make a kind of a Gaussian ansatz. So therefore, this is like kind of, uh, we assume that our knowledge of parameters, of like Hamiltonian parameters, uh, is specified just by the average values, right, and uh, some uh, correlations. Uh, that uh, if we run this procedure, it converges quite rapidly. So in this case, actually, you can the fact that it doesn't converge to something uh, uh, as a function of the number of steps, like how many iterations we do, uh, was really limited by the fact that in order to mimic uh, how hardware would uh, actually operate, we uh, we did we sort of uh, allowed only a finite number of measurements so somehow there's an intrinsic quantum noise because uh, every time you you run a quantum circuit then we do not assume that we sort of find out uh, the spectrum exactly we just say okay it's a classical measurement and therefore we just sort of collapse a quantum mechanical wave function we uh, and therefore uh, uh, like individual measurement is different from the average and then we just sample over this measurements okay so this is sort of the kind of software part uh, in a nutshell. So uh, now what, uh, let me at least briefly comment on interesting uh, physics question that arise when uh, we talk about implementing this on uh, uh, sort of classical hardware. So uh, usually when people think about errors, they think about very simple model kind of uncorrelated uh, noise like Markovian noise, but in reality, there like the actual hardware uh, is much more interesting. So, in particular, when we started uh, discussing with uh, colleagues working with uh, uh, with Marco Cetina, uh, he pointed out that uh, in their experiments uh, uh, in Ireland, a major problem of decoherence is longitudinal formants. And basically, you can think about it like this. So in the position, you prepare your ion chain, like right? so that I, and of course, you have like laser beams which are addressing individual ions. And in the beginning, laser beams are really uh, kind of pointing at the perfect, at the ions in their perfect position. But then uh, as time progresses, so longitudinal phonons, really kind of vibrations of the lattice, uh, sort of uh, like along the long axis of the trap, I mean, they're not involved in qubit operations. It's the transverse phonons which are involved. But uh, there is gradual heating, and uh, so uh, which is so schematically shown here. So the ions vibrate more and more. But of course, like laser beams are still pointing at the kind of old direction. And so as a result, the accuracy of uh, individual, like single qubit or two qubit operations, deteriorates as time progresses. And therefore, actually, uh, there is a kind of physical clock which is ticking, which is, uh, says that the more operations you do, the longer time it takes, the worse your operations become. And what does it mean for us? Okay, well, let's say we want to implement our evolution, right? We said, oh, we want some interaction Hamiltonian uh, uh, on uh, the sign based quantum computer. Well, okay, we know that we have to convert it into a sequence uh, of discrete gate. That's what is uh, often called traterization, right? So uh, like schematically, you can say we can implement XX, YY, and ZZ type of uh, two qubit gates. And of course, we can reduce them all uh, into kind of native gates for the system, which would be XX. And to make traterization error as small uh, as possible, uh, because you're really replacing continuous evolution by these discrete steps, you want to make the number of steps as large as possible. But this is where this hardware comes in and says, well, but if you actually try to break evolution into too many steps, 
you find that you need too many uh, uh, operations need. Uh, and if you have too many operations, by the end, actually your operations are going to be extremely lousy. So your actual quality will suffer. And of course, you can partially mitigate this error by sort of saying, well, okay, I know that maybe I, sh uh, I should make uh, my, should, uh, my sort of uh, laser intensity should increase over time because I'm, I know that my ions are likely to be displaced from the center and no matter which way it's displaced, uh, kind of the uh, intensity experienced by the atoms of, by ions will be decreased, but that's not enough. Uh, so, uh, and so actually just to illustrate uh, what I'm showing here is the spectrum when we just look at uh, the uh, kind of the spectrum, the CNMR spectrum also like for four spins computed with different number of gates. And okay, we start with just by including 200 uh, gates and you can see while well, it's, it's not, okay, there is clear difference with an actual uh, spectrum and that is because of traterization error. So now let us start increasing the number uh, of gates while we go from 200 to 500 and it has gotten much better. So if we increase the number of gates even further while well, the spectrum should increase even more. And in fact, we see that instead the spectrum is getting worse. And the reason it's getting worse is exactly this issue that the error of individual gates uh, uh, sort of uh, deteriorates uh, dramatically once we uh, increase uh, their number. And therefore, it gets even worse as yeah, we go to 900. And therefore, there are very interesting optimization problems that we have to solve. And I think the kind of the big lesson here is uh, that we should uh, when we think about uh, uh, actually running uh, actual uh, algorithms on uh, NISC devices, we should not think so much about platform independent, but we should really figure out what are platform specific issues and we should adapt our algorithms to, so, uh, to uh, specific platforms. Okay, so with this, let me uh, conclude. I, uh, try to uh, sort of give a brief overview of uh, the ideas uh, that we have been developing in the context of uh, uh, sort of quantum assisted NMR uh, inference uh, that uh, there is uh, clearly, uh, it's sort of a very important uh, problem from the practical perspective. And I think uh, uh, this is a promising application uh, for near scale uh, quantum computers, and it re uh, but uh, it requires uh, combining uh, sort of tools of uh, quantum simulations, uh, quantum uh, information, and classical uh, machine learning. And then once we sort of start uh, uh, sort of transferring this uh, theoretical algorithm to uh, actual hardware, there will be very interesting practical questions, some optimization uh, questions that arise, uh, uh, which uh, okay, hopefully uh, will, people will start thinking about uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eugene. So now it's time for questions. So let's see. Um, just a second. So we have a first question from uh, Roberta Citro. Please, Roberta. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Eugene, for this very stimulating, uh, interesting seminar. Uh, so I want to ask you, I don't um, understand why you need this uh, a quantum type of approach, because uh, I have always been thinking that the Monte Carlo calculation uh, may be performed, no? to, to, um, even for um, thousands of uh, particles, so it can be almost the exact method to calculate the correlation function, so you probably can comment on this. Uh, Robert, as you know, actually, dynamical correlation functions with Monte Carlo are very difficult. And you can actually get something in, uh, like in Matsubara frequencies, but then transferring this information to real frequencies is an ill-defined problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, there are very few studies uh, of, uh, you know, when they use Monte Carlo to compute the dyna dynamical response function. And even in the cases when it does work, it sort of relies on sort of knowledge of what the spectrum should look like. Because otherwise, there is no kind of well-defined procedure for going from imaginary frequencies to real frequencies. Yeah. But there are some applications to NMR, for example, um, to study benzene molecules or something like that. So Yes. Yeah. So what, a, I mean, obviously, like NMR is a big field and people have been working on it. So what they usually do, they 
like the way we would think about it is, you know, writing Bogolubov chain, you write equations of motion for spin, this sort of connects to two spins, when two spins connect time evolution, let's say time derivative of two spins to three spins. So they go up to, I think at most like four and then they just truncate. Yes, yes. And so the belief is they say, oh, look, we believe that we know our molecules consist of clusters of spins and we can completely neglect uh, interactions. So more than four spins never interact with each other. I mean, it may work, let's say in some percentage of cases, but clearly there are more complicated uh, molecules where it does fail. And so you are, to me, it seems like an uncontrolled approximation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then we have a question from Luigi. Yes, uh, thank you for this very inspiring talk. So I have a general question uh, uh, on, uh, say, this quantum circuits VQE and, uh, uh, approach. Basically, as far as I understand, basically, uh, you try to op so you, you try to, to optimize. Uh, uh, so basically, you you target the Hamiltonian, right? Mm -hmm. you, you try to obtain always either the ground state or in your case, just to go the kind of inverse procedure to get the, uh, in any case you get the Hamiltonian, right? Now, um, or uh, is it any possibility instead to, to target uh, a different uh, operator? Say, I make an example, otherwise it's too uh, vague. So, in atomtronics and in many applications, actually, we are uh, uh, obsessed by the current. Okay, so you want to some current, uh, and you want to make a simulator based on the current. Now, the question is: Can you construct a simulator uh, based on the current without any reference to Hamiltonian? Which I'm not sure I understand your question. Like, so the way we use this quantum simulators was to extract spin-spin correlation function. Yes. So yes, we could equally we well yeah, then construct we'll, something we'll, that would be current-current correlation function. Kind but of still, I, yes, but you, you need the, the ground state. No, no, right? uh, that's what I emphasized. We, the reason why this problem is exponentially hard is because we have to average over infinite temperature ensemble. Okay, so See, you we actually that uh, you can calculate correlation correlation uh, as, as current current correlation functions, and then in that way you target uh, the current. This is what, what you're saying. So okay, uh, to emphasize like so like the problems that we were solving, right? Look, we look at the spin spin correlation function, but look at the density matrix. It's a density matrix which corresponds to infinite temperature. Therefore, we average over all states of the system and there is exponentially a large number of them. But one can come up with a similar protocol, uh, like where instead of like spin-spin, this would be current-current correlator. Mm. I mean, and, the, uh, and we can also do it at finite temperature, although it's sort of uh, slightly more, uh, it's kind of more difficult, but Roughly, the procedures, are, you know, the way you do it is somewhat reminiscent of how people do it in DMRG, right? Which is intrinsically quantum mechanical, but you can use ancillary space to get uh, sort of uh, either maximal entangled space states, which is this infinite temperature, which is what we did, uh, or you can also try it for uh, finite temperature. Yeah, uh, very, but very so you know, the operators which come in, they really sort of uh, come in into. Uh, like, you know, when I uh, describe here how we prepare the uh, initial, basically I had two spin operators and in the preparation, so our preparation uh, used the fact that we had to condition on magnetization. And then what we were measuring at the end was all like, so this was this kind of the, the weight was given by magnetization. What we were measuring at the end was also magnetization. But you can generalize this procedure so that you prepare initial state based on the current. Mm. And that what you measure at the end is also the current. So this approach, I think, can be used to measure any dynamical correlation function. Yeah. Okay. But again, but going back to your question, like ground state, like if we if we only needed the ground state, we would 
it would be a completely different problem. Like the reason why we need like a system and an Ancilla copy is because we need infinite temperature ensemble. Yes. Yes. So that's actually what is different yes. between the I, usual. I still don't have the intuition because I mean, of course, let's assume uh, we have this reduced problem in which you want to understand the ground state of a given Hamiltonian with VQE, okay? Then, I mean, it is a, uh, the tar the, then the, the, the goal is pretty simple. You have to minimize uh, the energy. So we have the energy, so assume you have the energy and you try to minimize and then you get the ground state, right? So this is a- this Yeah, is but a, it's completely yeah, different. No, I understand that this is, clearly, this is completely different, but I want to, to that maybe you make a, a more comment because I don't have still the intuition of what you're doing. Because it's a, a say, a, then uh, say, assume that you have, uh, 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 say again, in my example, the current, so, what is the optimization that you have to do to get it? So what kind of uh, uh, optimal procedure sh you should uh, impose to get the right answer, this D? Again, in, in VQE or in our case, in VQE, you in have to specify your procedure in terms of some gates and then you optimize I, I, with respect I, to those have, gates. Yeah, what I have in mind is VQE, but I think in your case, will be, I have the feeling that this, your case is a little bit more powerful. It's yeah, in our case, because you see, we're not really uh, optimizing, say, the Hamiltonian, we just, but rather the quantum part for us is just get this, the spectrum at infinite temperature. And then what we are optimizing is because I know the spectrums that nature gave me, right? Because we know that our sort of friends in uh, kind of in, uh, from biomedical research, they measured the NMR spectrum. And we, we need to tell them what is the Hamiltonian that produces the spectrum. So then what we're optimizing is agreement between the, spectru be between the spectrums that we get from our trial Hamiltonian and the spectrum that nature gives us. So and from that point of view, it's fairly different. Yeah. Okay, so but, um, think of it. Thank yeah, you. there is a question from Quack. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Anna. Uh, thank you, Yushin, for your next talk. But uh, when you talk about 500 gates, are you referring to a simulator or the actual computer? An actual computer, yeah. We really sort of converted it into the number of actual gates uh, that would be done on an ion based uh, quantum computer. But they, each, each gate would have its inherent noise. So the more, the more gates you have, you actually right, but, but, quite, but you see, that is my point. You cannot just assign a fidelity to a single gate. See, like uh -huh. what actually went into our calculation was a physical model of how noise, because what's happening is, uh, as I said, it's all about longitudinal phonons, right? And you start with uh, basically a small number of phonons, and then the this chain is heating up. And therefore, what you find is uh, that actually the errors are very strongly correlated because if at a certain time you have a large number of phonons, right, you have strong vibrations, then like during the next gate, this number of phonons will change, but it will not change dramatically, right? It can, like the system is doing diffusion in energy space. And that's why errors are very strongly correlated. See, we really modeled like the full non-Markovian nature of noise in the sign chain. And you need two copies of the of, of the state or of the spin because uh, in your algorithms you have no you in have this a... case actually okay this this was a calculation for a, for a kind of a simpler protocol in which you just compute correlations in time on a quantum it's yeah we did not sort of because as you know quantum hardware uh, is sort of is still limited so this protocol which we design in which uh, even uh, the kind of Fourier spectrum is computed at the level of hardware, it requires more qubits. So here we did a, like a simpler procedure. Let's just compute this time dependent correlation function on a quantum computer and then do Fourier transform by hand, like classical on a classical computer. Mm -hmm. So that's why we only need the number of, like in this case, these are four spins and therefore it's really just uh, sort of four a quantum computer with four uh, qubits. 
I, I also have a question, Eugene. Um, it's about um, how good is the spin Hamiltonian to describe the metabolomics? So is there, um, because as a physicist, we really like the spin models, but um, it's a little bit idealized. So uh, is there any study that it would work to describe uh, the reality? Not so much. Uh, I mean, people know that once we talk about, let's, an, an MR on the surfaces, right? I mean, yeah, you really mm -hmm. have to worry about an isotropy of the polar interactions. Uh, so the reason why there is uh, this uh, kind of large width uh, of the peaks is probably exactly this physics, right? About the like, complications of the polar interactions between uh, spins uh, of hydrogen. I, I, okay, well, uh, I'm not an expert, but sort of like this somehow we tried to look for some literature. We did not find a uh, sort of serious discussion. It looks like this canonical model works. So people just adopt it and you can find, you know, like for molecules which are known, you can find, okay, the name of the molecule, the spectrum and this sort of canonical Hamiltonian. But okay. so I think that your question would be, well, is there, can we maybe look more carefully into say the width of individual peaks rather than, because in our model, we just say, oh, that there is like some kind of decoherence rate, but like we just call it gamma, right? And, and that's it, right? But uh, in principle, there should be a theory behind it. So it should come from dipolar interaction, I don't know, interaction of spins with these kind of the uh, diamagnetic and some kind of uh, diamagnetic screening uh, of the environment. I don't think this uh, has been understood very well, but I have to admit I'm not an expert. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it will be probably something to do at some point if you really want to apply to, uh, well, to cure cancer or <laughs> so, or to really realistic applications or. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not. You think it would okay, work? We, we can talk, anyway? I'm not. Um, at least this would not, okay. No, it is an interesting question, but I, mm -hmm. I'm, I don't know how, like how, whether this is something that our biomedical friends would be particularly excited about. Uh, I think <laughs> okay. for they, I, in some sense, you can say they need us as, as engineers. They really want us to be able uh, to, okay, at least at this time, produce Hamiltonians from the spectra, right? And the fact, like, what exactly is the theory behind, like, this width, they don't care. Okay, yeah, we'll see. Okay, anyway, it's a very interesting um, direction and for sure very useful. <laughs> so with that, I don't see any further questions and it's a little bit late too. So I, pre I propose to thank Eugene and close this uh, session.